say, I was hoping to interject before um, Kim got off there, but if we zoomed out from Iceland, there's kind of an interesting development at the 1A Women's World Championship where China is going to be back in the uh, big pool next time around. They're, they're about to win the 1A Championship they're hosting, and right now it's either going to be Netherlands, Denmark, or uh, Austria that would join them in the in the relegation process. And uh, anyway, so that's kind of a bit of a surprising development, I would say, because I I don't it's think unless the Toronto six player just scored the winning goal. Pardon? Lee Alum, our Toronto six player, just scored the championship goal to beat Austria. Yeah, I wondered uh, how many North Americans are um, uh, are, are playing for, for China, but... Um, yeah, yeah, because well, it's at home in Shenzhen, I think that they got a lot back. They all changed their names then, because it's not apparent that... Right, well, they have their Chinese names. Yeah. They have Chinese backgrounds, and uh, I was involved three years ago when... Uh, uh, the identify uh, camp in Toronto of U20 players, identifying players, and Brian Adolski came in taking over the pro team, and he also coached them, I believe, in the Olympics in, in uh, China. Yeah, yeah. I thought he was coaching now, but it's the head coach of Mercyhurst. We have a girl, Cassie Bettenall from Calgary, that played uh, – Hockey here, went to Minnesota. Then I believe she went to Colgate. And she's been over there all year training. And uh, I got a text yesterday from Mike Kennedy. Uh, it was actually a, a, a large text, including a lot of people, about the crowds that are at that tournament were pretty enormous. And uh, I'm really impressed with the entertainment part and the engagement of the crowd. Uh, at those competitions and I think I watched the world's women's soccer championship where they had crowds of 70,000 in the stands and I've watched that soccer as much or more than I watch the men's soccer it's just well that venue Wally is where the CWHL we played out of there and um, that venue is packed for CWHL games I mean 10,000 people jammed in there to watch pro women's hockey so clearly it's um uh, well promoted in the in the city and Shenzhen itself is uh, that's where it's the Universiad um, uh, was competed there so it's great facilities for not just hockey but basketball table tennis there's a ton there but that's where they lived and trained the CWHL t team and now I guess they play in the Russian league um, but they train out of there it's a great yeah great spot now listen I I had a I wanted to share with you topics that might happen moving forward, but uh, anybody here, feel free to interject any time. But these are things that have been happening in my world. Daryl Belfry has been in touch with me. He's written a second book. Uh, I purchased two copies last night. Tim, I'm going to give one to you. It's on offensive hockey. Nice. Uh, Thanks, Wally. He's going to be on, I think, in the future. I'd like to hear what he has to say about his book and his level of thinking, because it obviously uh, is in the area of offensive hockey IQ and execution in tactical situations. And uh, interestingly enough, um, I had a long conversation with Josh Morrissey yesterday a Winnipeg Jet defenseman, and uh, Sammy, you might have met him, I don't know, but uh, I taught uh, high school. His uh, dad was a science teacher and basketball coach at our high school, so as he grew up, I followed Josh, knew him when he went to play junior. I went to games with his dad and got to know him really well, and uh, his dad passed away a year ago, and I just reached out to Josh to see how he's doing because his dad ran a hockey camp for years called D Rules, coaching defensemen. And uh, he was really a, a hands-on, knowledgeable father coach. 
and with uh, his loss, I just wanted to reach out to Josh, and we had a conversation yesterday that relates to the questions I asked Kim about hockey IQ. How do you transfer those skills that p players do have into practical use in the game? And uh, I saw Josh play in the World Juniors. I felt his skills were unbelievable. His IQ was unbelievable, yet he didn't get on the power play until the last two games. He was one of their best players. The same happened with Makar the first time he played. So we talked about that. And I talked about the NHL. Um, his relationship, Rick Bonessa appreciates him and is going to his offensive uh, idea. But we talked about hockey IQ. And I talked about Daryl Belfry working with the best players who have obvious unbelievable individual skills and a higher level of IQ than average players. Josh made the comment yesterday that there may be three players on his team that can think at that and execute at that level. And that, to me, is, it's not alarming, it's, it makes sense. Like the NHL game, relies on those star players to do those things. And it's basically, they've learned how to do it. They, they have developed their hockey IQ. I believe we can teach that sooner than later. Sammy, you mentioned a while ago about your, your girl, little girls, learning to scan. Just see. See the ice and make a decision to make a play. And I, I think fundamentally, down the road, uh, I told uh, Josh I'm going to send him the video of the interview with his uh, Daryl Belfry's daughter. And I said she talked through one shift, Josh, and she described all the decisions she made. and. You will appreciate that. So I'm just hoping to get this all connected with what we're doing and trying to do, trying to get the game to another level because I think it's sort of spinning its wheels developmentally. Um, Tom, are, are you? Did you finish your ice time? Yeah, I finished with the college girl, and I'm going to work with. Uh... U15 and U13 sisters in five minutes. Okay. I don't know if you heard very much, but any thoughts to share and what I've said or you've heard? Yeah, you know, what What you've said, it makes a lot of sense. And I think we we have to remember that hockey is a game of transition, that each team gets a puck three or four times every minute. You know, and about 180 to 200 times a game. So, you know, good habits are so important. And faking and, you know, making players lean on these these kind of things, you know, to, to set up things that I, I don't think, I don't know if we teach very much of that. And that, you know, and that tight evasive turn, like you said, being the key to the breakout is, you know, I totally agree with that. You know, you got to, a defenseman like Yersinov, when I coached with him in Salzburg, he said he wanted the defenseman to try to beat the first four checker every time. So then you're always going hard. You know, you may make a quick pass, but you know that should be the intention. So you go in there hard and you make an ev evasive move. So yeah, I agree with what you're saying. Hey Tom, uh, I'm glad Sammy's on because I've been watching girls U13, 15. Uh, uh, preparation camps using nothing but small area games. And uh, the work you did when I watched those girls at the U15 camps run by Global, it's evident 
they have a hockey IQ. They've improved their skills because of the time spent at your school and all the private work they've done in the summer. But what I saw in the U15 ice time in small area games blew me away in terms of the eyes up, getting open space, completing passes, making plays. Now in the other arena, twin arena, but in Great Plains, I walked over and watched the U18 AAAs tryouts, which are just scrimmaging. And there's no two passes in a row. If you had two passes in a row, it was a reason to cheer. It was all about compete, battle, turn the puck over, not possess the puck to make plays. But I would say in in a shift, there would be about 10 turnovers to the puck being given away. There was no team possession and no passing. So that's something as the whole association, I'd like to influence with the help of what you're doing, Tom, and what we're talking about here, um, it's the biggest thing is lacking. People think, and Tim, you would know in our day, they always said you can't teach IQ. You can't teach hockey sense. And I don't know what everybody else thinks and can comment on, but uh, Sammy, what do you think? Can you teach hockey sense? I mean, I think you certainly can, just like you can teach um, a struggling student to learn uh, in the classroom. I think that there's different ways to teach different things. And Hockey Sense is just another aspect of learning. Um, but I do think that where I struggle sometimes as a coach is so, you know, transitioning. Obviously, I when I teach goalie sense, that is easy. I know it. I can feel it. I I know I can see the minutia of the position, but when you then transition or maybe you're a coach that didn't play at the highest level, how do you coach yourself and learn yourself tactically to then be able to teach it? Um, so I think that that's sometimes where I struggle is, I even struggle um, sometimes when I'm trying to describe it on television as well um you know how do you talk from a point of expertise when you yourself can't physically do what you are saying um and maybe that's a question for all of you guys that you know i i think on a certain level i can do all of this and then i go into a women's rec game and my feet don't take me where i want to go and it's all you know it's at a different level but when i'm coaching it i certainly can see it i can execute it but I myself can't execute it so then how do you teach somebody to get to that point so um don't talk to Tim on this because he can do it all and he played in the NHL so that's mm -hmm. maybe not mm -hmm. it's you're coming at it from the same perspective as me when I teach goalies so I would love to hear maybe how you teach hockey sense when you yourself don't have it I have I think if I could offer one thing that we've talked about before and definitely be interested in hearing from Rick and Tom, but as I mentioned before, like the games are such a great um, teacher, as we have all said before. I think, you know, one of the simplest things is to, you know, in terms of teaching puck support is just to always be uh, encouraging your players to figure out where the puck might go next, both offensively and defensively. And if you can get them thinking that as a primary thought, I think they become more intelligent uh, because then they start moving, obviously, to help defend defensively and help support offensively. And as I've said before, I, I think you can – be in the year of seven and eight year olds, nine year olds, and just have coaches always, oh, well, you know, in that situation, where might the puck go next? You got to try to figure that out. It's not everybody on, on the puck, it's everybody supporting each other. And so always try to be thinking where the puck's going to go next. Now, that's such a big piece of it. 
Hope you're mu you're muted, Sammy. I love that idea because that's what we do in goaltending is what's the next best threat. But it also reminded me of working with my daughter in uh, math as she prepared Paris for grade three here and adding multiple different things. So um, it might be eight plus seven plus one plus two plus three and you have to add them all together. And so she starts with eight plus seven. And so that's hard for you know a seven year old to kind of figure out eight plus seven. You got to count, count it on your fingers. But reversing it and trying to look at it holistically, like what would be the easiest thing to do? Would it be just add one to eight? That might be a little bit easier or two plus three. Like, can you kind of put them together? And that's how I see the sense of the game is sort of like that. Like what, what is the next best threat? How do I assess what is happening on the bench, on the in the game, all of that? And so from a um, on ice perspective, I get that that is, um, has, I mean, that has certainly helped me being able to do that. So I love that idea of teaching the coach to just simply have the player assess and scan. And I don't know if it was on this call or whether I read it in a book or something, but to, it sounds like a kind of a Wally thing, but to have the player give you the feedback when they get off the ice. Like, what did you see? What other options did you have? What, um, you know, having that conversation so that they're thinking through it and you're not telling them what it is. Anyways, Wally has a setup. This is very philosophical. Uh, I like your idea of the math and the idea of uh, working at one pair of numbers at a time and then adding a third, sort of that blocking. Now, looking at it holistically, I think the first thing about hockey sense is it's get the picture. And once they have a picture in their mind, and I do forecheck in one minute, and this forecheck that I do can be done at the NHL level, and it can be done at the novice whole ice level and half ice level. In fact, Samantha Holmes is doing it. And it's a part of their coaching summit curriculum package. And that's the old claw. You look at your hand, the coach sees it, Close the hand in front of them. It's a one, two, two. The first player is the middle finger and they're steering and the others are width and depth, getting the picture and they, ah, the right winger and the right defenseman don't cross the middle of the ice. You want to spread out, support, somebody falls down, the numbers change. That's your forecheck. So the, now that's playing without the puck. With the puck, Tim mentioned the idea of passing. And I I believe that passing is exactly what you said. It's awareness of how much pressure is there. Where is the open space? It's the other people that have to get open. And the person with the puck has to have enough, create enough space and time to see what's happening and use that player and make that pass. So make yourself available and the passer has to have the, create the time and space using those tactical skills to make plays. So that's my connection of the, you know, and I, I don't know, Sam, does that, does that make sense relating it? When you said that, is there a different way of teaching math? Well, that's my way of teaching thinking. That's hockey sense. Let them play. They'll figure it out themselves when you get a picture. So how do you then teach Wally? So Josh Morrissey said there's three players on his team that really think at that level. So then how do you teach those others who have a lifetime in the game, um, you know, are at the NHL level, to think at that level. Now, Daryl, I mean, when it, why don't I watch him do it? I mean, he seems to just have it. So obviously some coaches can do that, but what are your thoughts on that, I guess? Well, I, I don't believe you can start at the top and work down. I think what you've got at that level is what you've got at that level. And coaches still coach center, right winger, left winger, go here, go there. Uh, and but the kids that are coming up are being taught F1, F2, F3. 
And as Tom said, one, two, three, four, five. I talked to Tom Mar uh, Josh Marcy about it. I said, it's not positions. If your coach is talking about center right winger, and they are in the NHL, we have to forget about them. We have to worry about the kids that are growing up and the coaches that are coaching them that are growing up with them until they all get to the advanced level of thinking, which is basically the idea of seeing the big picture and making decisions with everything you're doing. So does that make sense, Sam? I, I like, as far as Joss is concerned, I think that it's sort of a, you're sort of on an island uh, as a player and it's a five-man game, a five-man unit. Back in the Soviet days, Tarasov called it star teamwork. Five interchangeable parts. Now, did they interchange positions like we're talking about? No, they didn't. Oh, yes, they did, I think, Wally. Well, Tim, and I'm glad you said that because, I mean, they were doing it. We aren't doing it yet. We're still doing pretty damn good in the world standard of play at the highest level i'm just saying my concern is the youth the growth up the ladder getting the picture keeping a positive approach to developing them all to feel free to think and make decisions but teach them how to have the time and space to make decisions with and without the puck so i know at all I get, I'll interject in and trying to connect dots too. Like I completely agree with your your choice of words there, Wally. That seeing or getting the picture is one of the biggest parts of hockey sense, and that's where again, if you go back to you know coaches always encouraging players to always be thinking, where's the puck going to go next, or where could it go next? What are the one or two main options? That e either encourages, or both, it encourages and requires players to start taking in information and looking around. Uh, you know, so many times um, players that uh, either lack hockey sense or appear to lack hockey sense are, are like Wally says, are unaware of what's going on around them. So the promotion of scanning and like Peter Smith always liked to say, you know, take in information, know what your options are, know what the other players' options are. That's hockey sense. And those simple questions is in your head, hey, where could it go next? Um, offensively, defensively, that's the essence. That's like everything. And one, of, one of the things, just uh, one last thing, you know, we certainly noticed um, – with the working with the Danish girls, and I, I'm hoping they can win their last game and get a positive goal differential and maybe sneak back into second place there. But um, one of the things we are guilty of as a group too many times is coming over the offensive blue line with the puck and being focused. And this is one of the dangers I wanted to get in with Kim. When you start to encourage one-on-one -on -one play in the open ice, you get focused on that one-on-one -on -one play. And one of the things I think really needs to be addressed is to get the broader vision. Like, so we did some simple drills where, you know, we just said, hey, you know, you're carrying that puck across or approaching the offensive blue line. We need to see you looking across the ice to get a sense of, do I have support? Do I not have support? Do we have numbers? Do we not have numbers? Because that was one of the biggest areas that we were lacking was recognizing when we had support and, um, and uh, you know, creating offense through that. So, Tim, though, I just want to mention on that, before that one player looks around, the coach has coached, create two-on-ones close support, quick close support. So that's part of the big picture. Yeah. Of, uh, it's one thing for one to scan and make a decision. Now it's another thing to sort of tell them what to do to so that we outnumber them, create two on ones, that's close support. 
Where's the third player? Is the fourth player coming across? Whatever. Everything will happen in a, a more natural fashion relative to the situation rather than in a structured fashion. The only structure to me is the principle of outnumbering them, create two-on-ones, communicate on the ice together, but communication isn't by yelling so much as it is by eye contact. And that can be learned, as Sammy said, scanning at a very young age. Yeah, and and I think, um, you know, it's kind of like three levels there, like we talked about. First, developing the habit to try to figure out where the puck can go next. Then, as you say, Wally, sort of Daryl's big thing, create the mini two-on-ones, like the closest player that's able to try to figure out how you can create a mini two-on-one to be an option. And then the next closest offensive player, maybe you try to figure out where you can create, uh, you know, either a, a change the point of attack option or a little uh, a, a sort of a section, second passing option. So, you know, all those things sort of link together to create offensive um, hockey sense. Peter, go ahead and welcome. And you're muted, yeah. All right, I think I'm good. And you're no longer driving, which is a good thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not good for anybody. Not, but first off, hello everybody. Good to see you all again. Uh, looks like we're getting back into it, which is great. Uh, uh, and Tim, just to your point there, when you're talking about the Danish team there and uh, coming over the line and that whole one-on-one -on -one issue, the other piece too, when they do look across the ice, is for me it creates uh, an element of deception. Too, because if I'm doing it properly, I'm turning my head, I'm taking a good look. Now, all of a sudden, that defender has a moment of doubt. Is this still, am I still playing a one-on-one? -on -one? Should I be moving to another spot? Because now it looks like the play is changing different, which buys you a little bit of time at the at the higher levels, like college on up. Like that could be a, a difference maker too. So the, the piece of the point of deception and just taking away the one-on-one, because -on -one. the thing that drives me nuts, I've been watching a lot of video um, from certain different college teams, and just watching them take the puck wide as if they're robots, and the defender just keeps them outside the dot, and that's it. Instead of looking across, like you're saying, maybe pulling up a little bit, using a little deception, trying to beat that one-on-one. -on -one. I just That struck a chord with me when you uh, brought that up, that's all. Yeah, and players can you learn to obviously um, add that to their individual tactical package. Like, as the offensive player, I might be thinking, okay, Wally, I'm going to try to beat you one-on-one, -on -one, but as I approach that blue line, just like you're saying, Peter, I'm going to beat Wally by looking across and maybe changing my pace or slowing down like I'm looking to pass, and all of a sudden, boom, I'm going to try to beat you with a move. Like, it's a really important part of the whole picture. Peter, in, in keeping with what you said, <clears throat> the idea of look one way, pass another, that's deceptive part of like fake a shot, pass, that's deception. It creates doubt, indecision, and it creates space because there's hesitation. So whether it's a de deceptive tight turn, or look one way past the other, or just a little flinch and a fake, that's going to make a lot of more than one person bite. And it's going to create the time and space that's going to allow the finishing of the play. If you teach that tactical skill, you know, deceptive quick puck movement, the deception of the head fake is critical. If you can't skate well, the head fake will work but let's get them both working. Now, Brad Rorinka years ago, Tim did, uh, went to a hockey school. He had U13 kids on the ice. They were pretty skilled. It was all five on zero breakout. Every breakout was look one way past the other. It was, it was quite amazing at that age. But I think these are things that how do, we get coaches to begin to 
allow their players to put that into their toolboxes on the ice. It's just sort of one-on-one -on -one and the binders are on and they're going and they don't see and aren't aware of anything around them. And I'm witnessing this as I watch U13s up to U18s in girls hockey and the U15 group up uh, demonstrating their extreme hockey IQ compared to what I've seen before that have been sort of gotten a year under their belt of being coached and taught hockey IQ, uh, particularly those with Tom's team. Rick? Yeah, on, on that topic, Wally, um, where 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 my head's at now with that uh, IQ and and who's controlling? In most situations over the years, the puck carrier is in control of the game. Everybody is watching to see what he's going to do, and then they try to fit in offensively to support that. And coaches say you need to support, you need close support, you need far support. It's a term, but do they really take the time to explain it and drill them at it, make them understand what it is? I'm, I'm at the mind now where your support players need to be driving the play, not the puck carrier. Puck carrier is scanning to see what, what's available. The support players should be scanning to see where the free ice is and where I can be of help and then get there and let them know and demand the puck. Plain and simple. And that... That's uh, that's the basic Anatoly Tarasov, the old quote that when they were at their peak, they had his whole thing was the puck carrier is dependent on the four other players, whereas North America, more so at that time, the, the, the thinking was um, the opposite, that the four players over here were dependent on what the puck carrier was going to do. So we had it asked backwards, and we're starting to figure it out. Um, really kind of interesting. Yeah. Just the other Rick thing is, if I can jump back in here, is that I, I just don't think in my observation that coaches, A, spend enough time trying to teach hockey sense, partly maybe because they're not sure about what it is anyways. And in order to do it right, in my opinion, you need to slow the practices down. You can't just run high-paced high flow drills to teach this. You need to go through the mechanics, the same as, as breaking down the passing skill with eight-year-olds. And and yes, that uh, that eats up a little extra ice time on you, but the dividends, once they, once they understand visually by having experienced it, seen it, been caused to repeat it enough times to start breaking old habits, then you start to see it in game play. Yeah, and I think we all know that Far too many, uh, well, I was going to say young coaches, but far too many coaches generally get overly focused on the tactical, the big tactical, team tactical picture. What's our forecheck look like? What's our D zone look like? You know, all that stuff, which is important, but they get overly focused on that. They don't spend any time thinking about and evaluating with the players their individual hockey decisions and hockey sense um you know it it's really one of the cardinal coaching errors that that's all too prevalent along with the the over focus on you know correcting errors versus looking for opportunities to provide positive support like hey great job on the forecheck there or a great net drive or a great back check or uh, way to have your stick down um, defending or on the forecheck. Look for the good things to support the players and the things you want to see more. So there are those two cardinal coaching errors, you know, looking just to correct mistakes and getting overly focused on the big tactical picture. Rick, I'd, I'd like to speak to what you said. Slow things down, talk about things, ask questions. Make them think about what you're doing. Take some time. And that's one thing I mentioned to one of the global coaches. They were doing excellent, 
outstanding small area games with decision making and those tactics and deceptive skating and uh, evasive passing. Oh, they were all built in. But taking time between to talk about what was happening, praising what was happening, so they would go out and do it even better. Now, Rick, coaches, this is a teaching sequence related to what you said. Um, it's not talking to the players about what about this, what about that. That is the Johanny Walston's three-step progression for hockey sense. And it was, I've sent it out before, but I'm going to edit this portion of the video and ask anybody who want, wants to get the drill sequence. The first one is six on a circle or five, passing one puck, then two, then three, and do not interrupt until they pass, because it will happen. Two pucks will go to one person. This is the teaching point. Get your eyes up, pass to only one person who's available. Such a simple little drill, followed up by a give and go drill with a coach in the corner, receiving a pass from a player on the blue line and going in for to receive a shot, receive a pass and shoot. But the coach keeps their head down. The player has to save ice until eye contact's made. And then they go in. And then you can put a player in the corner. That's what I mean about this is this was done 30 years ago by a Finnish coach. And they obviously have team offensive skills that have, you know, we can borrow from them, steal from them, try to apply those things from them. Um, I, th I think that's my point is. Your point, Rick, is take the time to talk about it. They process it in their minds, think about it. I think average coaches see it as a mistake to condemn rather than an opportunity to discuss and learn from. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, as part of my preparation for the team I'm going to be working with this year, I've, I've been gathering up information. There was a, uh, a group online that was offering a training camp program. So I, I subscribed to it. And to my surprise, when I started watching the videos, guess who showed up? You said 30 years back, Wally. Uh, what, he, what he was basing his whole program on was the old gold series. Yeah. Dave King, uh, Jean Perron, Pierre Paget. Um, yeah. He's basically exerted that as, yeah. as his talking points. And, you know, when you go back to uh, slowing down your practice and giving detailed instruction and letting the players, kids or adults, doesn't matter, uh, get an actual feel and understanding of what you're talking about and what this terminology actually means is what that goal series was all about. And it's still applicable today, in my opinion. Yeah. And obviously in somebody else's opinion, because he's making lots of money selling it. But. Yeah. Well, Rick, I was with Dave King, and he when he put goals one together, he had a drill, Sammy, where there were... Um, he shot a puck in from the point around the boards hard and he had two players race for it and of course he shot it hard and they all went straight to the puck in the corner rather than take the lane to where the puck was going to go so he was teaching what tim suggested thinking ahead with these kids the simple thing like I'm shooting this puck in, go get it. And they all over skated directly to the puck before they eventually got on the puck. And Dave King's progression with the national team, free puck races, 
bums against the boards. Two players racing to a puck a short distance away, winning the lane to the puck. You teach those things, and they'll do those things once they experience it. Right now, it's trial and error. And the players do a pretty good job getting it with trial and error. But I think, and Sammy, you would know this with young daughters, that asking them more questions, they will discover more and do more than by us telling them. Any comments, Sammy? No, I love that. I, I feel like I'm you're reiterating a lot of things that are such common thought processes, you know, like but putting the ownership on the athlete to um, to learn. And you're right. I think you can teach these at any age and um, there is uh, there's hope for us all, I think. I'm still learning. And, and to, and to um, sort of add on to Rick's comments there about you know, trying to, for, as a coach, trying to allow yourself or force yourself to slow down practice um, at least at a couple of points each practice and not just um, obviously give instruction, but ask for feedback. Like, you know, what do you, what do you guys think? You know, even, even as simply as, hey, why do you think I stopped this game at this point? What am, what am I seeing that maybe we can learn we can all learn from but to ask them for feedback what are they seeing you know both the people watching the games if it's a small area game watching the game take place and the players that are actually playing the game um you know it's so if you're going to take that opportunity to slow down it's a good opportunity obviously to ask for some feedback from the player players <clears throat> tim Thank for thank you for saying that because uh, working with global and their small area games, their competitive small area games were exhausting to the point where the last two small area games they played, the players could barely stand up, let alone execute. And I got to talk to them after and uh, exactly what you said. And I'm going to write this down and do it moving forward is say, recommend to them, take breaks so they can recover, talk about the drill, what its purpose is and what they're doing well, and watch for those things and comment on them as they happen. Yeah, watch for the positive things, not yes. the errors. Yeah. yeah. Both, but. Now, I want to tell you, uh, <clears throat> talking to Josh Morrissey, we had the same conversation. I said, Josh, if I coach in the NHL, I wouldn't tell you one thing. I wouldn't tell any NHL player one thing. I'd be asking him, what were you doing? Why were you doing it? Tell me. They know more than me. They're out there. They're in the heat of the battle. Their brains are working so much quicker than mine. And that's the essence of coaching. And I think the ability to ask questions where we have answers in our minds and we're going to tell them is something that we have to back off, go from yelling to telling, constructive direction, but more importantly, to asking to engage them in thinking about what they're doing. And that was Rick's point precisely. Slow the drill down. Take time to talk about it. You might have eight drills in the plan. You might only get through six, but you'll accomplish more. And if all else fails, I think run nothing but small area games. Let the game teach. Be positive. You'll probably win more championships. And I've seen that happen. So, any more messages out there, Sammy? You, uh, I can't believe that somebody hasn't gotten 